Hey guys, and welcome back to another video essay where I talk about whatever I want. Today's topic is to be a female character in the world of Attack on Titan. So to start this off, I just want to preface this by saying this is assuming the events in chapter 139 are canon. We know, in fact, that a lot of weird stuff happened with Isayama, with the, the, the company, with Kodansha. We know a lot of weird stuff happened. We don't know exactly what, but we know this isn't where exactly the story was leading. So there will be a little bit of me trying to express, I guess, some of the inconsistencies. But this is assuming chapter 139 is canon. So let's get things started, right? Subject number one. Annie Leonhardt. Starting with Annie, I already mentioned in a previous video that this is a very one-dimensional character, okay? She has no character development within the entire series. There is nothing she has to really confront inside of herself. There is no want versus need conflict that she goes through. Very, very one-dimensional. And now I will say that we can attribute some of this. It is in part due to her removal, complete removal from the plot. Locking Annie in the crystal for umpteen years was an easy way to make her lose her relevance and an easy way to not have her confront current events in the story. None of that helps or adds to explain or excuse the fact that she's in love with Armin or at least dating Armin. None of that explains that or excuses it. Armin figures out that it is Annie who is the female Titan. Armin devises a plan in which the entire city is destroyed to capture the female Titan who is Annie. Armin is the reason she couldn't do the one thing she wanted in the entire series. To go home and be with her father. Not only is their romance weird for Armin's character, it's also very much weird for her own. He is the sole thing that kept her away from her dream, being with her father. He is the sole reason she could not return to him. In a way, we can say that Armin is one of her captors. Armin is her initial captor. Yet, except when it comes to Eren, everyone else in the series at the end is easy to forgive, easy to move on, easy to forget all of the atrocities and all of the, the blame. You are the reason I was in captivity for years. You, Armin, are the reason I couldn't be with my father. I love you. <laughs> It's weird and it's uncomfortable and it's odd and it does not make sense. We get the sorry excuse that these feelings that Annie feels back for Armin are mutual because he talked to her for all those years when she was in her crystallized form. And on the opposite end of that, we don't really get an explanation for why Armin likes Annie, unless of course it is just the fact that he's being semi-influenced by Bert's past memories and his own feelings and dreams and aspirations. What is that saying then to the audience? What do we the audience pick up from their relationship, from their perceived romance, from their perceived mutual understanding and friendship and yes, romance? What are we then to gather from that? Is it supposed to make us uncomfortable? Are we supposed to keep thinking about it? Are we supposed to be thinking it doesn't add up and it doesn't make sense? Because that is the impression that Armin X Annie has left on me. Now, when the female Titan first shows herself, first terrorizes the Survey Corps, for some reason she doesn't kill Armin. Now, with chapter 139, it's possible that this is because it was not yet Armin's time to die or something bizarre or crazy like that, right? Because prior to that moment, they have no interaction whatsoever. In other words, it doesn't make sense that she didn't kill him at this moment. But I guess only Ymir knows. To be Annie Leonhart is to be suddenly in love with someone after one conscious encounter. 
Subject two, Historia Reese. <laughs> now I did a previous video about why it made sense that Historia and Eren um, were endgame and how Historia is a parallel to Ymir. I made these prior to 139, right? I never did a character analysis on Historia, so here's that now. <laughs> Historia is a character with a humble, tragic beginning. Just like Eren, she witnessed the death of her mom. She was told she should never be born. And these are the words that she mirrors to Eren. The words she tells Eren in his most depressive state. When someone says that they shouldn't be born, I want to be there to tell them that they're wrong. Now, I can almost feel your eyes rolling to the back of your head, but this isn't me going off on some shipping tangent. Like I've said in previous videos, I am not a shipper. I don't care about the ships of Attack on Titan, so long as they aren't weird and don't make the material or the themes of the story off-putting, like this entire list does. So that is why I must go into Aaron and Historia's relationship to fully explain uh, so you can process what makes what happened to Historia's character stick to the wall a little bit better for you. What went wrong here? Why this is disgusting? I could argue that the entire series of Attack on Titan was setting up for Eren and Historia to be endgame. Let me know if you want that video. Oh wait, I already made it. It's in the cards. The entire series was setting Eren and Historia up to be endgame. To wrap up all the morals and the theme of the story. I'm not going to get too much into it in this video. You can go watch that one. But like I said, Eren is the first person who accepts Historia as herself, right? It's the devil and the worst girl in the world. Can someone explain to me how then instead of with Eren, she decides to have a baby with the farmer, the farmer, her ex bully, who only doesn't bully her now because she's a soldier, because she's the queen. Now, this is her bully farmer, right? Her bully, not her childhood friend, not her orphanage helper. It's her bully. They justified their relationship. Whatever was going on with Historia in this farmer, they justified this as him owing her a favor after bullying her. Owing her a favor. Does that sound like any kind of healthy relationship to you? You owe me one. Let's have a baby now. Oh, remember that time you threw that rock and it hit me in the forehead? It made me bleed. And I got dizzy. You owe me one. Let's have a baby. Now, in Isayama canon, right, not Kodansha canon, Kodansha canon, I would say, is chapters 131 and down, right? We're talking about Isayama canon, 130 and before, okay? In Isayama canon, we know this deal, you owe me one, between the relationship between the farmer and Historia was just him pretending, a placeholder, protecting Historia until the rumbling was over. Or until Aaron got back. Or whatever. We know that this was not set up to be some romantic pairing. This was not set up to be the father of the child that Historia carries. We know this. But chapter 139 will piss on you and call it rain because it wants you to believe that everything you've seen building up between Aaron and Historia was just to amount to her spouting his words to her people at the end of the series, which is not where the series was leading at all. And again, the smart people, the people over here um, in my camp, we know that this isn't how the series was supposed to end. Arahisu was always in game. We spend a great deal of the series of Aaron just getting super agitated and super upset. Uh, we will end the cycle of children paying for the sins of their fathers or taking up roles that their parents place on them and so on and so forth. I will not sacrifice Historia and so on and so forth. Yet that is exactly how this series ends. That's exactly how the series ends. Historia is sacrificed and she sacrifices herself by word of Aaron. 
Aaron, should I have a baby? This a chapter 139 wants you to believe that Aaron said, yes, Historia, go with your past bully and have this child for no reason. The only path that ends the Titan curse or whatever was what Aaron saw in his future, right? And then it's the path Aaron chose or whatever was manipulated to choose, right? The only path that ended with the Titan curse, quote, quote, ending, right? That's the one he went with, correct? So then if he knew all of this, what was the point of his story of being sacrificed? What was the point of her having a baby, what was the point of her losing her virginity to an ex-bully if the entire time she could have just ate Zeke and she could have just been the Beast Titan for 16 minutes and then he could have done the rumbling and then story over, Historia not sacrificed in any way, shape, or form. That leads you to believe that the baby was important for Aaron's plan, right? Before the entire story got scrapped and retconned, right? But that's a different video. What we're talking about now is how Historia could choose, how and why she could choose to have this baby with this, this ex-bully, this random guy that I, I presume she hasn't spoken to since her days as a child. It would make sense for her to tell this guy, hey, risk your life, stay at this house and protect me. You owe me one. While I carry Aaron's child into this world, the only guy I have a connection with, the only guy this series has spent so long to build this connection between me and him. What doesn't make sense is her choosing to have this baby with this ex-bully this guy who threw stones and rocks at her, right? And then at the end of the series, what, growing in love, growing in love with him and then marrying him, right? Because she isn't married and the series makes it a deal to tell you, hey, they're not even married and they had a baby. Haha, <laughs> what? And it's gossip from the MPs and such, right? That was just leading to a completely different ending, which is another video. I know I keep bringing it up, but sorry. Um, disgusting. And Historia's character was not developed so it could regress to her again going with somebody's stupid plan and doing something she doesn't want to do. She looks absolutely miserable. So why did she do it? Why? To be Historia is to be in like with your ex-bully. Then have his baby then marry him now it's break time okay time for a little intermission because people swear that i hate attack on titan i just hate the ending i love the series attack on titan right this the ending the way it ends the way the female character stories all wrap up it does disgust me and it does ruin the rewatch value of the series but it can't take away my initial love of everything prior to chapters like 136 and down, right? So let's get into a couple of well-written, awesome, amazing female characters. To kick things off, let's start with Freckled Ymir, okay? So the definition of a perfect side character, perfect side character is one who influences and motivates one of the main characters changes the course of their life, inspires them, or influences them in some way. And Ymir is that perfect character. She's so well written, so well developed, perfectly curated. She's just such a good character. And there's a reason why a lot of people like her. And I, I would say unanimously, most of the, fa the fandom, probably all of the fandom, loves Freckled Ymir. Her philosophy and her just demeanor and everything just perfectly contradicts uh, Krista's, right? Because she was Krista then. Um, and it's just so beautiful when they're together, how these two characters who aren't alike in any way come together. And, you know, despite their differences, they work. Now, Ymir has the intuition to know something's off with Krista. She finds immediate interest in her, right? And she's like, Hmm. 
there's something more going on here than meets the eye. She picks up on Krista's Ymir from the book, right? Uh, the other Ymir, found a Ymir. She picks up on the little facade that Krista has going on. And she lets her know, once I tell you my secret, you have to promise to drop whatever this facade is. Whatever this is, you gotta stop it. And that's exactly what happens. Yet, chapter 139 retcons this and makes this whole entire scene um, completely obsolete because now Krista is still just taking on ro roles. Whatever needs, whatever this person wants her to do next, yeah, she'll do it. Whatever this person wants her to do next, yeah, she'll do it, of course. Why not? <laughs> With the way Attack on Titan ends, this entire scene is rendered useless because she she doesn't stop taking on roles. She doesn't stop listening and yes-manning to everybody who gives her an order. She asks Aaron, should she have this baby? He says, yes, have it with this farmer, 139 wants you to believe, when in reality, not only would Aaron never ask her to have a baby with some random man, he knows she doesn't know any boys, any decent boys to, to have a baby with. He knows that. He is the only decent guy who even cares about her. So he would, first of all, he never asked her to have a baby with Farmer Coon or with anybody else other than himself if it was necessary to whatever plan he had. And second of all, she wouldn't even, if asked to have a baby with the farmer, she'd be like, absolutely not. I'm living for myself. I'm living for myself and I'm going to carry the child into the world, the first free Eldian child with the devil that granted me, that granted us this freedom. Aaron Yeager. Let's keep going since we're on a roll, right? Let's get into Sasha. So <laughs> Sasha's character is set up kind of as a joke, right? She's the comedic relief. She's the funny potato girl, whatever, but, -da. but she's an amazing character and people don't give her enough credit for that sometimes. They get lost and caught up in the potato memes and the jokes and the food, I'm hungry and all that, da -da -da. but she's actually a really, really good and well-written character. And she, I, I love Sasha, I do. She's, she's a little eccentric, right? Like Hanji, but not quite so much like Hanji, but she's a great character and her character development is good. You know, she goes from being this coward, um, just sacrificing herself, right? To this like trained, um, brave, courageous woman, right? She saves that little girl, the Titan and all that, right? But remember when she first joins the survey corpse, she's shaking in her boots, Right, she's super scared when she first sees a titan and all that. She's like, mm, and then all of that changes. And I don't know, she's just a really good character. I love Sasha. You know, since I talked about a character I really love, let me get on to one that I really hate. <laughs> uh, Gabby, I hate her. I still do, which is a good thing. This is a good thing, guys. When, uh, when someone, a fan of a series, say they hate a character, it's usually a good thing because it means that character is so well written that you have negative feelings for them, you know? If she was poorly written or some just stupid blob filler character you know i wouldn't have any emotion towards her at all but she isn't she's she's important to the plot right and she's you know well written so i i hate her i do she's the only female character with like a real character arc now we're gonna get back to that because i said real character arc <laughs> only character arcs taken seriously were reiner's and gabby's and aaron's until 138 and 139 of course but on the topic of arcs, we have to jump back in and talk about subject number three, Mikasa Ackerman. So for 80% of the story, Mikasa was a one-dimensional Aaron Saver character thing. She was Aaron, 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 right? 24-7. And the only way for her character to progress or get development or go anywhere was obviously her separation from Aaron. Not just her separation though, and that trips a lot of people up. Her separation and her moving on from Aaron. Now that second part is the most important part. After the separation, if the obsession is still there, then there's no character development. 
but her spending 80% of the story in Edda, <laughs> in Edda mode, her spending 80% of the story in Eren mode, Eren savior mode, makes the perceived character development in the final arc that much more satisfying. You get this feeling of, finally, she's finally separating herself from him. She's finally realizing that, oh my goodness, I don't know what I was seeing in him the whole time. And on top of that, we watch her learn to care about more people, like other than Aaron, right? Um, the I don't know why, but I think about this a lot. The scene in when um, the Survey Corps, you know, finally beats Kenny and they get to Aaron and they're unlocking the little things around his wrists and ankles when he's in that cave and his story's about to eat him. Blah, blah, blah. They're unlocking him and Mikasa doesn't go straight to Aaron in that scene. She goes straight to protect Historia from hitting her head on the back end of the cave. Go, go watch that scene again. When they save Aaron, Mikasa is the, the only one who goes straight to Historia when all the, the gust of wind blows and Historia is blowing back and she's about to hit her head. Mikasa goes and saves Historia. Now this is just slowly peeling the band-aid off, right? That, hey, Mikasa can care about other people. And look, she's starting to. There's a scene where she explicitly tells some characters, hey, I have people in my heart already and I'm running out of people I can care about, right? So she's basically telling the people, the characters, hey, I don't give a fuck about you. I don't care what you're going through. And we see this start to change. She begins to open her heart to more people. But like I said, she's able to separate herself from Aaron, but never separate her mental from the obsession. We watch her... You know, the whole development is scrapped after, what, Aaron or Ymir sends her the little hallucination, tells her to forget about him. You know, Aaron tells her, oh, forget about me one last time, right? She takes the scarf out of her stomach, out of her, <laughs> out of her shirt, wraps it around herself, and literally never takes it off after that. Literally dies in that scarf. So she kills Aaron... <laughs> but she can't get over him. She separates herself from him physically, but mentally, he he still owns her. I'm sorry, I could, just, I could just imagine her, like, having sex with Jean, wearing the scarf, like, damn. But not only does her, you know, her obsession rule her and her actions, she forces two generations of her family to visit his little tombstone. What? Where did the character development go? What? I don't get it. To be Mikasa is to be uh, in love with the literal devil, accomplisher of Nada, mass murderer, and slave to his memory. Subject number four, Ymir. Now, I don't even like to talk about this character at all. The way this series ends in regards to her just leaves the most, ever most sour taste in my mouth. Really. Like, it's, it's sour, guys. Ymir Fritz is the worst character of all time. She had the most potential in this series, and her relationship with Aaron was just set up to be so symbolic and, and memorable and, and great and amazing and just game-changing. Yet, we got what we got. And you, you know what that means. That's loaded as hell. We got what we got. Now, Ymir is characterized as someone who was brutalized and tortured so much that their very brain is captive due to the suffering she endured. And it makes perfect sense. A child survivor of severe abuse cannot be completely psychologically sound, right? She chooses to die instead of regenerate because she was suffering so badly. Um, you know... 139 retcons this of course but yet she chooses to endure and impose 2,000 years of suffering onto her descendants all because she apparently loved this guy even as he played with other women in front of her even as he rips out her tongue 
and has her hunted, even as he gouges out her eyes, even as he rapes her and forces her children to cannibalize her body, and even as he begins the 2,000 years of suffering, she loves him and it is everlasting. Ew. Is this supposed to be some kind of, like, I'm not even sure at this point what this is. This is our fourth character who should not be in love with someone, yet they are. Someone who's done terrible things, yet she is in love with him and it is everlasting. Now, aside, this is the biggest sin of chapter 139 because it retcons literally every single theme in the entire series. This isn't a series about slavery and subjugation and freedom and humanity. This is a series about love. Terrible, terrible love. To be Ymir Fritz is to be a child rape survivor, in love with the slaughterer of your family, mutilator of your body, and cattle breeder of your children. To be a female character in Attack on Titan is to be a girl plagued with a sick desire for someone who doesn't return the feelings. The feelings aren't mutual. And when they are, it doesn't matter because they're no good for you. In fact, they're the worst thing for you, but you love them anyway and you love them for life. Okay, guys, so uh, that was the video. <laughs> um, yeah, this series is kind of disgusting when you think about it. Like, how the female characters' stories all wrap up is just literally disgusting. Um, leaves the worst taste in my mouth, especially Ymir. That's, that's, like, evidence to me. I don't know what's going on upstairs, but that's evidence to me that this series was not supposed to end like this at all. I don't know what happened to Isayama. I would love to know. I would still like the Isayama cut. So if he wouldn't stop try, if he would, you know, please stop doing damage control, saying, oh, this was how it was supposed to end all along, blah, blah, retconning himself, retconning the story, please stop. Please stop. Because no one respects you at this point. Um... But yeah, that's um my little spiel on Attack on Titan on the female characters. I thought it was disgusting. And um I know it wasn't supposed to end this way. So I wanted I really wish we could have what he actually wanted to say. Because I know, I know everyone knows this story was never about sick love. This story was never about finding one's own freedom from their disgusting love that shouldn't even exist. I don't know. I don't know what this sto this series is trying to say at this point. When everything prior to 136, I could say definitively that I know this story is about the humanity's struggle against subjugation and racism and, you know, cycles and, like, ending the cycle and whatnot and so on and so forth. And, like, so many people who are much smarter than I have said, this series was supposed to end in world peace. This series, the ending of this series was supposed to be world peace. And the only way that could have been accomplished was through the fucking genocide. Dead ass. Or... I don't know, maybe if the Lelouch thing worked somehow, you know, we could all have just been pretentious and believed that, hey, um, Aaron wipes out 40, let's say, percent of humanity, and the, you know, the gang stops him, and the whole world somehow is there to see it, and, you know, they're like, hey, ah, uh, the people who born and raised him killed him. So they are good, you know, and then kumbaya, right? Uh, ending's garbage, and I'll end there. Oh, but wait, it's almost 30 minutes, so I'll just keep going until 30, it's 30 on the dot. Um, I have Patreon now, so if you want to, like, see extra, like, stupid shit by me, go ahead and <laughs> subby to my Patreon. 
I literally have zero patrons, but like, you know, there's stuff on there already. So if you want, you know, just head on over there, sis or bro. <laughs> um, I'll be at Anime Midwest in like next week, uh, July 2nd, 3rd and 4th. So if you see me, um, say hi, say hi. I'm going to go as Favaro. <laughs>